The Defense Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, today, the subcommittee will receive testimony from the Honorable Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, General Mark Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Undersecretary Mike McCord, the Department's Comptroller and CFO. The Department of Defense is requesting $825 billion with this subcommittee's, uh, in the subcommittee's jurisdiction. It's a modest increase from fiscal year 23, particularly as we enter the middle of a decisive decade for security and prosperity of our nation and the world. In many ways, the Biden administration has put the United States at a serious disadvantage. First, a short-sighted political decision to got a hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan, resulting in a rapid resumption of power by the Taliban. The return of a permissive operating space for al-Qaeda, a strategic failure of geopolitical competition, and ultimately the tragic loss of 13 U.S. service members at Abbey Gate. One of the brave Americans lost that day was Lance Corporal Kareem Nakui. My constituents, he shouldn't have, he should never have happened. I'm still waiting for a sliver of accountability from this president and an answer to when the people who orchestrated this attack will be brought to justice. This is to say nothing of the thousands of unvetted Afghans allowed to depart the country for U.S. and allied soil, some of which may be the thousands of terrorists released from the prison at Bagram Airfield. Secretary Austin, these events have made the world a more dangerous place. Moreover, the administration's concept of integrated deterrence failed to deter Putin from invading Ukraine and waging the largest conflict in Europe since World War II. It's well documented that President Biden and his national security team knew that Russia would invade months in advance. Frankly, there was an open source information that foreshadowed the invasion. The administration had an opportunity before a single shot was fired to rally NATO, arm Ukraine, and make clear to Putin and his thugs that Russia aggression toward a sovereign Ukraine would come at a tremendous cost to them. But the Biden national security team failed to act quickly, and today they continue to compound this error by giving Ukraine just enough assistance to survive, but not enough to win. Even today, as Russia and Ukraine prepare for spring offensives, the administration has testified that it's not requesting additional funding. By our assessment, however, your remaining presidential drawdown authority for security assistance will only last another two to three months. I want to be clear, Congress will not be writing blank checks. It's important that you communicate future requests for funding for Ukraine clearly, thoroughly, and early. Congress will need sufficient time to review and ask questions on any request submitted. In isolation, the failings I detailed are unconscionable, but events do not happen in a vacuum. The administration's continued failure to anticipate and implement a coherent geopolitical strategy that is now compounded by China's rapid modernization and preparations to attempt to reclaim Taiwan in this decade. Weakness is provocative, and this administration's weakness has emboldened authoritarians around the world. Today, China, not the United States, is brokering peace negotiations in the Middle East. The U.S. is losing influence as the world's partner of choice, and the reason is all too clear. In terms of our own modernization, too many of our weapon systems are delayed due to the status quo, risk adverse mindset, the bureaucracy of the procurement process, and the lack of consistency for our defense industrial base. By the assessment of some senior defense officials and military leaders, a modernized U.S. force in 2030 will arrive too late to deter a forced reunification of Taiwan by the Chinese Communist Party. As General Douglas MacArthur famously said, the history of failure in war can be summed up in two words, too late. Too late in comprehending the deadly purpose of a potential enemy, too late in realizing the mortal danger, too late in preparing, too late in uniting all possible forces of resistance. Two words, too late. We must be ready to fight tonight and rapidly modernized to maintain the world's greatest fighting force, 
to pick one over the other is a false choice. I do not want to be the chairman presiding over World War III. I hope to hear how this budget changes China's increasingly aggressive behavior today, if not tomorrow or in 2030. With a budget of over $800 billion, 3.4 million employees, and a fiscal presence of over 4,000 sites in 160 countries, the Department of Defense is also the world's largest business. I expect the department to implement efficiencies and identify cost-saving measures in its business operations. Today, the DOD relies on too many antiquated systems that cannot talk to each other and too many manual processes. These outdated systems and processes lead to unsuccessful financial audits, duplication of effort, a frustrated workforce where top talent is difficult to retain, and unsustainable trajectory for personnel costs. And this year, you are requesting 3,500 net more, uh, more people. For what? The same department that developed six-generation fighters is running a second-generation IT system. And the resulting inefficiencies are eating into the department's ability to invest in the future. Regardless of the challenges we face internally and externally, I will ensure that our service members and their families have the best quality of life we can afford. And they have the best equipment possible. So if we do get into a fight, we win, they lose. That's it. Before we hear from our witnesses, I would like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, Ms. McCollum, for any opening comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the courtesy. I would, too, like to welcome Secretary Austin and General Milley and Undersecretary McCord. General Milley, this could be your last appearance before the subcommittee, so I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the families of Minnesota's 4th Congressional District and myself to thank you and your family for your 43 years of dedicated service to our nation. For fiscal year 2024, the President has proposed $825.3 billion within our subcommittee's jurisdiction. That is a 3.2% increase above what was enacted in fiscal year 2023. This budget request builds on the work of the last Congress that ensured America meets our pacing threats and meets the needs of our servicemen and women and their families. This modest increased proposal for fiscal year 2024 is consistent with the national defense strategy. I would like to point out that if we review the growth of the defense bill over the past two fiscal years, we see a nearly $100 billion increase, or we could call it 11.8%. Each one of these dollars represents an increased effort to defend, deter threats to our nation. But I would argue that we have more than adequately resourced the Department of Defense in recent years. We, we must be both realistic and careful about the continuing trend of inflation defense spending well beyond this administration's request. Congress must be better about making the hard choices when it comes to the defense budget. We can no longer continue to fund out-of-date legacy systems that are no longer relevant, not survivable, or too costly to maintain in both dollars and cents. And the personnel required to maintain them could be better used in our modernization efforts. Instead, we must prioritize the modernization of our force and the investments in emerging technologies like quantum computing, artificial intelligence that will drive decision making and the future of modern combat. The Appropriations Committee must also remember we're only as strong abroad as we are here at home. The previous Congress and the Biden administration made two years of key investments in the American people. Transportation, clean energy, health care, education, and workforce development. If we fail to continue investing in the American people, then will we not only fail the next generation of Americans, but we will be unable to capitalize in the investments in our defense budget that require a strong American workforce. If we want to support the continued investments in our shipyards, aerospace industry, our microelectronics industry base, we must be sure that we are investing in the inputs and support those industrial efforts, and that simply is our people. To put it plainly, we cannot afford to fund, to fund the defense bill at the, on the backs of the 11 other appropriation bills. 
And speaking of here at home, I want to commend Secretary Austin and the department for the recent reproductive health care policy decision. The department's policy is legal, it's fair, and it will provide our service women and their families the health care that they are entitled to. Turning back to the FY24 defense budget, I was encouraged to see the increase for climate change efforts. Resiliency at our installations is vital to our ability to train and to win. As this request um, works to track industry trends and standards, I look forward to hearing how the funds will empower our military in the future. And finally, you know how concerned I am about your efforts in the Arctic and the challenges we face from our adversaries there. I look forward to hearing how this budget will support the strategies not only in Europe and the Indo-Pacific, but how it will address th threats in the Arctic. And Mr. Chair, I know how deeply impacted you were by the loss of your constituent at Abbey Gate. But I have to point out, it was the Trump administration, not President Biden, that negotiated the deal with the Taliban to withdraw the forces, our forces from Afghanistan. And I personally believe that if President Trump had been reelected, that there was little doubt he would have pulled our troops out early in 2021. Mr. Chair, I look forward to working with you. Once again, I thank Secretary Austin, General Milley, and Undersecretary McCord, McCord for your service to this country and for appearing here today. I thank you again for the courtesy, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. It's my pleasure now to recognize the chair of the committee, Ms. Granger. Thank you, Chairman Calvert. Uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing before us today. Every year, senior defense officials testify that the world is the most dangerous it has ever been. Unfortunately, that trend continues today. Our enemies have become more bold and in many cases more capable. Russia is waging an all-out war against the people of Ukraine. China continues to take pro pro provocative steps in the Pacific and spread its influence around the world. Iran is reportedly making significant strides in developing a nuclear weapon. And just last week, North Korea tested what they say is their largest intercontinental ballistic missile to send a message to the United States and our allies. The events over the past year emphasize why it's essential that Congress provide the funds to ensure we're ready for war. However, just putting money toward a problem is not going to be enough. The funds must be spent and invested thoroughly. We must do everything possible to break through the red tape and create a more responsive military. To do that, we need to remove the barriers that prevent us from quickly developing and implementing cutting edge technology. We owe it to the men and women of our military to give them the tools they need to deter our enemies and to enter the fight when necessary. Most importantly, we need leadership. As Chairman Culvert mentioned, the actions of this administration have put our national uh, security at risk, have our allies wondering if they can trust us and have shown weakness in our enemies. To close, I thank each of you for your service. We look forward to hearing your testimony today, and I thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Chair Granger. Uh, gentlemen, your full testimony uh, will be placed in the record. Members of the subcommittee are eager to hear, get to questions, so please give a brief summary of your statements. Secretary Austin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, Chair Granger, uh, Chairman Calver Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, distinguished members of the committee, uh, I'm glad to be with you today to testify in support of the President's budget request for fiscal year 2024. I'm joined, as always, by General Milley, and I remain grateful for his leadership. I'm also glad to be joined by the Department's Comptroller and CFO, Mike McCord. This is a budget aimed squarely at keeping America secure in the world of the 21st century. At $842 billion, it is a 3.2% increase over fiscal year 23 enacted, and a 13.4% and is 13.4% higher than fiscal year 22 enacted. This is a strategy-driven budget and one driven by the seriousness of our strategic competition with the People's Republic of China. This budget will help us continue to implement our 2022 national defense strategy and the President's national security strategy. 
Now, I have three key priorities at the Pentagon. To defend our nation, to take care of our outstanding people, and to succeed through teamwork. And the PRC is our pacing challenge, and we're driving hard to meet it. Our budget builds on our previous investments to deter aggression by increasing our edge. We're investing in a more resilient force posture in the Indo-Pacific and increasing the scale and scope of our exercises with our partners. And this budget includes a 40% increase over last year's for the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, and it's an all-time high of $9.1 billion. Now, that will fund a stronger force, present, force posture, uh, better defenses for Hawaii and Guam, and deeper cooperation with our allies and partners. Now, this budget also makes the department's largest ever investments in both R&D and procurement. We're re requesting more than $61 billion to sustain our air dominance, and that includes funding for fighters and the extraordinary B-21 strategic bomber that I helped unveil last December. We're also seeking more than $48 billion in sea power, including new construction of nine uh, battle force ships. And we're boosting capacity at America's shipyards to build the ships that our strategy demands. And we're investing a total of $1.2 billion in the submarine industrial base. And we're buying two Virginia-class attack submarines and one Columbia-class ballistic missile submarine. On land, we're investing in air and missile defense, and we're investing in defenses to counter unmanned aerial vehicles. We're also requesting $11 billion to deliver the mix of long-range fires that our security demands, including major investments in hypersonics. We'll also continue to modernize all three legs of our nuclear triad and bolster our strategic deterrence. And we put forward the largest space budget in Pentagon history. We've requested $33.3 billion to improve our capabilities, our resilience, and our command and control in space. Now, let me again thank Congress for providing the department with multi-year procurement authorities and appropriations for critical munitions. This helps send a consistent demand signal to industry. In this, in this budget, we're requesting more multi-year procurement uh, authority and we're asking for more than $30 billion to invest in the industrial base and to buy the maximum number of munitions that American industry can produce. This budget also moves us away from aging capabilities that aren't relevant to future conflicts, so we can focus on the advances that warfighters will need going forward. Now, our national defense strategy calls, calls out Putin's highly aggressive Russia as an acute threat. And under President Biden's leadership, the United States has rallied the world to help, fight, help Ukraine fight Russia's unprovoked and indefensible invasion. And our allies and partners have stepped up to provide crucial security assistance, coordinated through the Ukraine Defense Contact Group that I lead. And we will support Ukraine's defense for as long as it takes. And meanwhile, the department remains vigilant against other persist persistent threats, including Iran, North Korea, and global terrorist groups. And we're investing in over-the-horizon counterterrorism capabilities as well. This budget also invests in improving our readiness and resilience in the face of climate change and other 21st century threats that don't care about borders. And Mr. Chairman, we're going to remain the strongest military in the world, and that's because we have the best team in the world. And as we mark the 50th anniversary of our all-volunteer force, I'm enormously proud of the brave men and women who choose to wear the cloth of our nation. We owe it to them and their families to take the best possible care of all of our people. And over the past two years, we've made moves easier, we've cut commissary prices, we've made child care more affordable, and expanded job opportunities for military spouses. And this budget funds other key steps to increase the quality of life for our teammates including the largest military and civilian pay raises in decades. Now, we're also pushing hard to eliminate suicide in our ranks, including immediate steps to hire more mental health professionals and improve access to mental health care. And meanwhile, we're working toward a military that's free of sexual assault, 
We've worked with Congress to improve the response to improve the response to sexual assault and related crimes under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And those reforms will be fully implemented by the end of this year. And the department is also investing in a specialized workforce to combat sexual assault, harassment, suicide, and more. And on many installations, we're conducting on-site evaluations that tell us what's working and where more support is urgently needed. Now, the department's third priority is succeeding through teamwork. And our network of allies and partners magnifies our power and expands our security. And no other country on Earth has anything like it. And over the past few months in the Indo-Pacific, our friends have taken major steps forward. The Philippines has agreed to nearly double the number of sites where we cooperate together. Japan committed to double its defense spending. And we're going uh, to Ford Station, the 12th Marine Littoral Regiment, which is one of the most advanced uh, formations in the Corps, in Okinawa, so that we can better deter conflict in the first island chain. We've also made history with the AUKUS partnership. It is a generational initiative with our Australian and British allies to build game-changing defense advantages that will deter aggression and promote a free and, op and open Indo-Pacific and boost our defense industrial capability. And you can also see the profound power of our alliances in today's united NATO. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we further strengthen NATO's defense and deterrence on its eastern flank. And congressional leadership on the European Deterrence Initiative and our investments since 2014 helped us react quickly and boldly to Russia's cruel war of choice and made our deterrence even stronger. In sum, Mr. Chairman, this, this is the budget that will meet this moment, and I respectfully ask for your support. And the single most effective way that this committee can support the department and our outstanding troops is with an on-time full-year appropriation. So I look forward to working with everyone so that we can continue to defend our democracy and support the forces of freedom in this hour of challenge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Secretary Austin. I now recognize General Milley for his remarks. Chair Granger and Chair Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. And I have been distinctly privileged to defend this country for 43 consecutive years in uniform. And this will maybe be my last set of posture hearings. I want to thank the Congress up front for your continued support to our military, not only this year, but every year for the last four decades. And I am very privileged to represent the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and families of the United States Joint Force, alongside Secretary Austin and Mike McCord, who I want to thank personally for their leadership. Our Joint Force is the most lethal and capable military in the world. Our troops are the best led, best equipped, and best trained force anywhere because of your support. So thank you for what you have done. And yet again, I ask that you support this year's request with an on-time budget approval. Our mission, the mission of the uniformed military, and our purpose is very simple. It is to defend the United States of America, and our task is to fight and win in all domains of combat. In order to do that, our priorities are simple. Maintain high states of readiness while simultaneously modernizing for the future operating environment and taking care of our people and their families while always sustaining our values. Our end state is that America is secure and great power war is prevented. In order to protect the American people, readiness now and readiness in the future through modernization is our number one priority, and there is no other number one. The Joint Force will deliver modernization of our armed forces and security to the people of the United States at the FY24 budget request of $842 billion. And we will be good stewards of the American people's money, trust, and confidence. Right now, the international system is under stress. For the first time in our nation's history, the United States is facing two major nuclear powers whose vital national security interests are in competition with the United States. Both the People's Republic of China and Russia have the means to threaten our interests and our way of life. But war with Russia or China is neither inevitable nor imminent. Great power war has not happened in the last 80 years, in large part because of the rules put in place at the end of World War II and the capabilities of the United States military along with our allies and partners. The United States military was able to do that because we were 
and still are the most powerful military in the world. And we must remain so if great power war is to continue, great power peace is to continue to hold. This budget is driven by our strategy and deters war. This budget maintains our capabilities. It maintains our strengths and our high levels of readiness now, and it prepares us for the future. The People's Republic of China remains our number one long-term geostrategic security challenge, so-called pacing threat in our strategy. The PRC intends to be the regional hegemon in the Western Pacific and Asia within the next 10 years and exceed the United States' overall military capability by 2049, according to their open source speeches. The People's Republic of China's actions are moving it down the path towards confrontation and potential conflict with its neighbors and possibly the United States. But again, I say, China, war with China is neither inevitable nor imminent. Additionally, Russia is an acute threat and remains very dangerous. Over one year ago, Russia undertook an illegal and unprovoked war against Ukraine, threatening peace on the European continent and global stability. We are supporting Ukraine in its fight to protect its sovereignty and supporting our NATO allies with the United States force presence in every single nation on NATO's eastern flank. This fight is not just in Ukraine's interest. It is in the U.S. interest to protect the system that has prevented great power war for eight decades. Additionally, Iran threatens to push the Middle East into regional instability by continuing its support to terrorists and proxy forces. Also, Iran is taking actions to improve its capabilities to produce a nuclear weapon, should it make the decision to do so while continuing to build its missile forces. From the time of an Iranian decision, as you have heard in previous testimony from members of OSD, Iran could produce fissile material for a nuclear weapon in less than two weeks, and would only take several more months to produce an actual nuclear weapon. But the United States remains committed as a matter of policy that Iran will not have a fielded nuclear weapon. And we, the United States military, have developed multiple options for our national leadership to consider if or when Iran ever decides to develop an actual nuclear weapon. North Korea's continued ballistic missile testing and nuclear weapons development pose real threats to our homeland, as well as our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific. Terrorists continue to operate around the globe, threaten the United States and our allies and partners. But this budget supports both our prevention of war on the Korean Peninsula and our continued worldwide counterterrorism efforts. In concert with other elements of national power, the United States military stands ready to protect our nation's interests and the American people. And right now, today, as we sit here, we are currently standing watch on Freedom's Frontier with nearly a quarter of a million troops, 250,000 troops in Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and South America. The United States never fights alone. A key source of our strength to keep the peace and prevail in war is our large global network of alliances and partnerships. For example, just this month, we conducted 63 operations and joint and combined exercises globally with our allies and partners. In addition to that, we are currently training over 5,000 Ukrainian soldiers in neighboring countries. On a weekly basis, our Transportation Command is moving a small city's worth of logistics to enable our continued global operations. While well, one-third of our Navy, 100 ships, is on patrol ensuring freedom of maritime navigation, and our Air Force secures our skies. And lastly, our operational readiness rates are higher now than they've been in many, many years. Our minimum standard is about a third of the force of the highest states of readiness. There are 10,330 units in the United States military. 4,680 of them are active duty. 60% of our active duty force is at the highest states of readiness right now and could deploy to combat in less than 30 days. 10% could deploy to combat in less than 96 hours. This military is ready. We are prepared to fight now, and we will continue to be prepared to fight in the future. And this budget supports the programs and exercises at the service, joint, and combined levels to keep our military ready to defend the nation. Furthermore, the joint forces at an important inflection point. We must balance current operations readiness with future modernization. We must not allow ourselves to create the false trap that we can either modernize or focus only on today. We must do both. We must fully integrate developing technologies, including precision long-range fires, hypersonic weapons, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, and the pervasive all-domain sensors. The time is now. We have very little margin to wait. 
And the common thread critical to accomplish all of this is our people. We must continue investing in training, education, talent management in order to be prepared for a future operating environment. Additionally, we must ensure that we are taking care of our troops and their families' quality of life. I urge Congress to support this budget's significant pay raises, health care, housing, and child care initiatives. This budget sustains our current readiness and adapts the joint force to the future war fighting requirements. This is a matter of significant national security importance. And we must act with clear-eyed urgency. By doing so, no adversary should ever underestimate the resolve of our nation and the strength of our military. Preparation for war and deterring war is extraordinarily expensive, but it's not as expensive as fighting a war. And this budget prevents war and prepares us to fight it if necessary. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, Secretary uh, Austin, uh, China is building 20 ships a year and has a fleet of now over 400 vessels, uh, and as I understand, capable vessels. Meanwhile, the department's budget request proposes to decommission 11 ships this year while procuring nine. The request will shrink the Navy's fleet to 291 ships by fiscal year 228, uh, despite having a goal of 373 ships. Mr. Secretary, how does having fewer ships deter Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific? Well, thanks, Chairman. Um, well, let me begin by saying we, we have the most powerful and dominant uh, Navy in the world. Uh, and we will continue to make sure that it remains that way. Uh, as we look to invest in capabilities, we're looking for the right mix of capabilities uh, that, uh, that can support our warfighting concepts, uh, and we'll continue to remain focused on that. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, this budget, uh, we're asking for $48 billion uh, to invest in uh, effective naval forces. So uh, from our perspective, it's about making sure that we have uh, the right capabilities uh, to uh, to support our warfighting concepts, and I'm comfortable that we are we are moving in the right direction. Well, I understand the the need for increased capability. I, uh, but you you know the old saying you can't you can't catch a ball in left field if you only have a guy in right field. So numbers do matter, and your budget proposes to decommission eight ships before the end of their service life, and ship count matters, as I said earlier. Um, when are we going to see the department's 30-year shipbuilding plan? Well, uh, the uh, the Navy continues to work on that plan, and and it, it will uh, it as soon as they are uh, complete, certainly we'll uh, we'll bring it forward to Congress. Uh, okay, we'll look we we'll look forward to seeing that. Last week, uh, I led a congressional delegation of members to uh, Asia. In Taiwan, nearly every single leader we met with remarked at the extremely slow pace of U.S. defense uh, articles. Unfortunately, this is not a familiar theme, which uh, was highlighted last month uh, in our Ukraine hearing. Uh, Secretary Austin, what are Ukraine and Taiwan's most critical defense needs, and what steps are you taking to expedite and prioritize the delivery of these items? Well, two things. Uh, first, in, in terms of FMS, uh, we all recognize that there's been, uh, uh, we faced some headwinds as a result of uh, two years of COVID and, and pressure on supply chains and, and the inability of industry to, to really move at the pace that they wanted to move at. And I think uh, we'll, the industry will catch up uh, in terms of that backlog. Uh, it, but I have put together, I put together a Tiger team uh, months ago to really uh, dig down into the FMS uh, issues and, and identify uh, log jams and, and work through those log jams to try to expedite, do everything we can to help expedite uh, the, the uh, delivery of key platforms. Uh, and I've also put together a, uh, a group of senior leaders in the uh, department uh, to focus on this on a weekly, monthly basis uh, to make sure that we are providing the right kinds of capability that, that Taiwan needs. So, so this, is, this remains a, uh, an area of focus for the department. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I think the, the discussion about uh, the number of ships uh, is, is interesting, but as uh, General uh, Milley said, we don't go to war alone. So if we include uh, Australia, Canada, NATO, you know, all, all the great powers uh, that, that we work with, um, we would we would have a multiplying effect that neither China or Russia has. Would would that be a fair statement, um, Secretary um, Austin or General Milley? That, that is in fact uh, correct, uh, uh, Ranking Member McCollum. We uh, we always uh, fight as uh, with our allies and partners, uh, and uh, and again, their the capability that they bring to the table uh, magnifies our our overall capability. So. Uh, you, you could expect that in any instance uh, we would be able to draw upon some of their capability as well. So we work on a routine basis to make sure that we're interoperable uh, and, uh, and make sure that... Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I would like you to um, a little uh, uh, go into more importance on the recent, um, on, on February 2nd, the agreement that you signed with the Philippines, whichever one of you gentlemen want to answer that. Um, uh, President uh, Marco seems to have made some deliberate decisions to align more closely with the United States in, interest away from China. Um, could you um, kind of tell the, the committee more about this agreement with the Philippines and how you see it enhancing our efforts in the region? Because I think this goes back to the whole question of the multiplying effect of, of having resources that, that China and Russia do not have. And if there's any other uh, nations in Indo-Pak um, that you uh, see wanting to align more closely with the United States, uh, with, with China, with, as these new relationships that you've been working so hard along the state uh, to foster. Well, I, it's, I was, uh, as a matter of fact, out in the Philippines and uh, engaged uh, 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 the president uh, on this particular issue, and I was really pleased that uh, that the president made the decision to move forward and increase the number of uh, of sites where we could work uh, along so along with the Philippine forces uh, to increase interoperability and uh, and develop uh, uh, their skills as well. And it, it, it's actually a benefit to them, uh, as you know. Uh, so this this really. Uh, is a, a significant uh, um, move, a significant movement forward. I think uh, we'll continue to build upon this as as our airmen and and, and soldiers and sailors rotate in and out uh, and and work with the with the uh, the Philippine military. Um, so, if you take a look around the region, I mentioned AUKUS earlier. Uh, this is a generational capability. Uh, you know, as we develop a um, conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarine capability for uh, for Australia, uh, it will help uh, help us uh, make sure that uh, we can do the right things to c continue to deter uh, any uh, any adversary that would want to threaten or challenge uh, the free and in in and open Indo-Pacific. So, if you look at Japan, as I mentioned earlier, Japan has doubled this uh, uh, defense spending. Uh, it's allowed us to position uh, a, a new um, uh, element uh, in, uh, in, in Japan and in, in, in Okinawa. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, a, a number of the countries that, uh, that we have partnerships with or alliances with, uh, we continue to work to build and strengthen uh, those, uh, those alliances and partnerships. And so we've moved, uh, moved the ball in a significant distance down the field here in the last, uh, last couple of years. And I, I really feel good about uh, what we're doing uh, to, uh, to increase access and to strengthen partnerships. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Um, if if I could Chair. just make a quick comment on, on that. Mr. Chair, if that's allowed. General. Thank yeah. you for the courtesy. Uh, just two points. One is uh, you're correct on the allies and partners, uh, Australia, Japan, uh, but there's many other countries there as well, to include European countries. Uh, we've done exercises with the Brits and the French also in the Asia-Pacific region. So they are force multipliers. Uh, secondly is our subforce, which is rarely talked about, I'm not gonna talk about it in detail right now, but our subforce is incredibly, submarine force, incredibly capable and very deadly um, and extremely lethal. So uh, those two pieces I think would uh, make a huge difference and 
help deter any kind of aggression by China. The last thing is the Philippines, but the Philippines and other countries in that region, they sit astride the key sea lines of communication uh, that China relies on for their international access to the Middle East oil, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, those allies and partners of ours are, are fundamental. And us being able to conduct military operations or having access basing overflight to those countries in time of conflict or crisis uh, would be fundamental and it would give us a decisive advantage. Thank you. And hopefully we can speed up the acquisition of those Virginia class submarines. Ms. Granger. Secretary Austin, our enemies are developing stronger ties with nations throughout the South America. While we need to focus on the growing threats in Europe and the Pacific, we can't ignore the threats to the south of us. So what particular things are in your, your what you're presenting, uh, and what is our support for our partners in SOUTHCOM? Uh, this, uh, in, in uh, strengthening our relationships and maintaining access in, uh, in, in the SOUTHCOM area, is a key area of focus for, for us and our SOUTHCOM commander. Our SOUTHCOM commander, as you know, General Richardson, is absolutely focused on this and active. Uh, she's uh, increasing the number of engagements and where possible, uh, exercising with, uh, with partners. Uh, and, uh, and so I see this moving, continuing to move in a positive direction. We have some security force assistance uh, elements that are working with, uh, with various countries to to strengthen their indigenous capability to uh, to be able to protect their, their their sovereign territory. So so this is this is something that uh, we remain focused on, and I, I applaud what General Richardson is doing uh, in terms of uh, continuing to uh, develop uh, additional access and to strengthen uh, the relationships that are that already exist. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, uh, Mr. Laro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome our, our guests this morning, and I thank you, um, Mr. Secretary, Undersecretary, and uh, uh, Mr. McCord, thank you very, very much uh, for being here this morning. I apologize for being late, but there are, I think there's six hearings I'm going to get to between now and the end of the day. Um, uh, so let me just, um, th there has been the discussion of, 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 of the budget by uh, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, that what we ought to do with regard to the 2024 budget is to apply the uh, 2022 numbers. And within that, there are a number of folks who believe that uh, that, that may be true for um, uh, uh, non-defense efforts, but that, uh, and, and that we should hold, if you will, defense harmless in that, in that, in that effort. Um, and I, I want to just briefly quote uh, uh, Under Secretary McCord in a letter that you sent to the Appropriations Committee this week. Um, you stated, should, as some have suggested, the Defense Department be exempt from such reductions um, and the entire burden fall on non-defense discretionary agencies, the cuts would be just as harmful, even if distributed um, a, a, a differently. Um, our whole of government response uh, to Russia's aggression against Ukraine clearly demonstrates the value of integrating security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, sanctions, and export controls. No one agency could achieve the effects we are producing as a team, and deep cuts to any one of the agencies would undermine the effort as a whole. For any of the witnesses, could you please outline how the non-defense uh, funding affects the Department of Defense and our national security? For any of the witnesses, McCord, uh, I quoted you. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Ukraine's probably the most vivid example, uh, as I as said in the letter of the teamwork that we require with export control sanctions, every, every kind of tool, and this goes across. Right, we need an educated work. We need an educated workforce, which starts, you know, with with the school system. So we have all kinds of needs. Uh, Every time the Department of Homeland Security fails to get to the place they need to be to, we get called on to help. So there's so many connections of, of what we need to do. And as I think you are aware, if uh, I'm certainly aware that, 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 that Chair Granger and, and Chairman Calvert have 
are not uh, advocating deep cuts to defense. I understand that. But then as well. there's the math problem. Well, I said some. Right. There's the math problem that we all understand, right? If you, if you have half the discretionary budget is exempt, and, and that's what we're trying to, uh, to recognize in our response. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to look forward to your help in this effort. Yes, General. Uh, it, it, and as Mike has indicated, uh, it, is, it is always a whole of government effort uh, with these complex problem sets that we're dealing with. Uh, and the old saying that if you, you cut the uh, State Department's budget too much, then you, you need, to, need to buy more books. More ammunition. Right. Because uh, what we want to do is we want to drive things towards greater stability and security uh, around the globe. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the solution to every problem is not necessarily a, mili a military solution, but, but we need to work together uh, to, to provide access to other agencies so that they can, they can uh, uh, reach the places they need to reach and do the things they need to do. But, but it is a whole, uh, typically a whole of government effort, and I think we, we just need to remain mindful of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, I'm, if I might, I have, um, if you will, two parochial questions. I appreciate that, and I welcome your help as we move forward in terms of crafting the budget for, for 2020, uh, 2024. Uh, and as I said, two parochial questions. Uh, as we move to the future of Army aviation, develop the future long-range assault aircraft, the reconnaissance aircraft, um, and this is I'll be very, very brief. The question is related to the Black Hawk, uh, even the eventual fielding of a new Flora Rotary Ring air aircraft. I am told the Army will be still flying hundreds of uh, UH-60M Black Hawks for the next 40 years. Um, many are flying now. What are the DOD's plans to preserve the industrial base suppliers and workforce that built the Black Hawk? Black Hawk and vital to the Army aviation, the future. And I'll just add very, very quickly, this has to do um, <clears throat> uh, with the uh, uh, F-35. Uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity, Mr. Sec Secretary, um, that there have been really conflicting statements regarding uh, uh, Secretary Kendall's support for the upgrade. If you can just tell us uh, what is the Department of Defense position on whether to upgrade the existing F-135 or develop a new engine for the F-35? Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so That's fine. That's fine. I want to turn your mics on, too. Mm -hmm. And with regard to the Black Hawk? Well, we, there's no question that, uh, that your home state provides a tremendous capability to uh, Very proud to of it. Our, our overall uh, uh, defense effort. Uh, you mentioned uh, the long-range aviation uh, mm -hmm. piece. That, you, as you know, that, that's still a work in progress. That, uh, that's uh, in dispute. And because it's... Mm -hmm. uh, at that stage, uh, I'm not a, I'm not uh, able to make any comments. But, but, uh, but again, I think that'll that'll resolve itself going forward. And when it does, uh, we'll we'll make sure we come and, and brief you in a delegation. I, I've just meant I don't understand what the outs. You know that there is a dispute and there will be uh, a resolve of that. But it, it, there's also the issue of the continued uh, use of Black Hawk uh, helicopters and will you continue to be using the Black Hawk since it is, uh, many are flying right now, and uh, what will be, you, you, you know, the future of it's, the Black it's Hawk? It's a workhorse, as you know, and, uh, and so it'll be around for, for some time to come, and, and uh, in the meantime, uh, the Army and the other services continue to look for uh, uh, greater capability in the future, or additional capability in the future, and that, that work in terms of modernization will, will continue. But the Black Hawk has served as well, uh, I personally benefited from that, uh, that tremendous aircraft, and I, I have every expectation that it will continue to do so going forward. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me join many others and just thank all three of you for your service and your professionalism. Uh, I've had the opportunity to interact with you probably in ways you don't even remember in some cases. Uh, a lot over the course of your careers and uh, just have always been impressed again with the professionalism and the absolute dedication all three of you have shown to the country. So it's much appreciated and 
We wish you well and uh, General Milley and whatever your next endeavor is, but you certainly rendered exceptional service to our country, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to thank one other uh, entity uh, while I'm chatting here, and, and that's the United States Congress, because uh, uh, as General Milley went through the higher state of operational readiness we have and uh, some of the things we've accomplished, it struck me that Congress uh, has actually given uh, uh, the Department of Defense, and there's some differences even on this panel about that, more money than President Trump asked for and more money than President Biden has asked for. So Congress is, in, in a sense, responsible for those higher rates of readiness because we've used our judgment to say whatever the president's asked for may all be good. We think we need a little bit more. And I think that, that comes out of some of the things that happened with sequester and the Budget Control Act during, the, uh, during President Obama's era. But anyway, th those things have led us to a better position. And uh, my hope is uh, we'll do that again, quite frankly. I, I think your budget... There's a lot of good things in here. I think it needs to be more. You know, 3.2 percent in, in an era of 6 percent inflation is effectively a cut in inflation-adjusted dollars. There's two areas I want to both ask you about and flag for you that, uh, and for the committee that I'll, I'll be working on. And uh, it's uh, somewhat parochial, but I think it's in the national interest. Uh, the first is disappointed to see, particularly given the importance of artillery, as we've seen in um, uh, the situation in Ukraine to see for the third year in a row the Army has cut the uh, PIM, the Paladin Integrated Management Program. We managed to restore those cuts last year. I think probably, you know, we're still furnishing that, that system to the active and the National Guard, and we're now sending parts, lots of it to our allies and, and to the Ukrainians as well. So uh, I would just tell you there's not enough in the Army's budget to maintain the production lines that exist there. So I would ask you to, you know, why the cut? And and the answer may be that you just have too many other things to do. I get it. Your, your business is tough choices. That's, But I, I would argue that's a bad choice right now, particularly given the situation in Ukraine. The second is one that is uh, something that we all want to accomplish together. I just worry about the rate of it. Um, and that's the uh, transition from the E-3 to E-7 command and control platform. I have Tinker Air Force Base in my district. I have Fort Sill Army Post in my district. Um, and I'm all for transitioning from the E-3 to the E-7. It's a good decision. Should have honestly been done some time ago. But the rate of retirement for those E-3s is well ahead of the rate of acquisition. Uh, and that's partly just a production problem. I mean, you, takes a while to get a new aircraft up and running. And I worry about that interim time, because I think we are in a very dangerous world here where you're going to lose capacity. I'm not for keeping the E3s. I just want to retire, bring on E7s as we retire E3s so that we never put uh, you in the situation where you have to deny a combatant commander some capability that he or she thinks they need. Uh, and those are two I would just flag for you, and then ask for any response about uh, about either of those uh, those uh, items I mentioned. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me thank you and, and the entire Congress for you know, your incredible support over the years, and I absolutely agree with you that uh, we could not be who we are and do what we do without the, the tremendous support, tremendous con congressional support that we are provided routinely. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, on the Paladin, um, I, we continue to see the importance of artillery, you know, in, uh, in, in war fighting. Of course, you've seen us really hustle to make sure that Ukrainians have not only the, the weapons systems, but the munitions that they need to, uh, to re remain effective uh, in this fight. Um, the Army feels that uh, uh, the rate that they're, they're, they're being produced right now, uh, it meets their needs. Uh, and it also allows them to invest in, uh, in future capabilities as well. And, and so as the needs change, then the Army, of course, will, will just, continue. Just to, to make the point, Mr. Secretary, not to interrupt you, it meets your needs because Congress put more of them in there than you asked for last time. And we're reverting back to the same number. And I would just suggest Look, you got a lot of stuff across a lot of areas to deal with, and I respect that. You have to make a lot of really hard decisions. This one, I think, is one that 
uh, you run the risk of shutting down the line to some degree. So, I mean, we intervened the last two times and got it. And, and again, you got what you need. Uh, maybe we can do that again. But uh, I, I don't think they're being produced at the rate we need in your budget. They are being produced at the rate we need right now. Okay. So I interrupted you, and I apologize. Went over time. Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Russellberg, Rus Ruppersberger, excuse me. Thank, thank you, Mr. I Chairman. It takes one of these a long days. time to get it right, but you did it well. Thank you. Um, first thing, um, I want to acknowledge the leadership of uh, both of you. Uh, throughout my years, I've worked with you in Iraq, Afghanistan, and you are some of the, uh, the better leaders that I've worked with, and uh, you're doing a great job, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, the, the, I'm going to ask two questions, one of, one of each. Uh, first thing, um, I'm deeply concerned about, <clears throat> uh, and this is to General Milley, uh, I'm deeply concerned about efforts to reduce our defense top line to previous year's level, especially as China increases its own military spending uh, each year. If we don't prioritize investing in our national security today, uh, I fear we, we risk a much costlier fight with China down the road, whenever that may be, uh, whether it's 20... 25, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. General Milley, can you please describe the strategic uh, advantages we would be handing over to the Chinese Communist Party if the 2024 defense budget top line were to return to what it was in fiscal year 2022, or if we were to pass the budget a year late? Well, in, in both cases, we would have to uh, cut a significant amount of programs. Uh, uh, Congressman Cole met, just mentioned artillery, for example. We know that artillery inflicts 70 percent of all casualties in, in warfare. Um, we know that uh, other things, shipbuilding, for example, F-35, all these programs we're going to have to would have to uh, get cut back, um, and that's unfortunate. The other thing that would be cut is readiness. Uh, we know that if budgets aren't passed on time, you can't do uh, multi-year contracts. You can't give. Uh, you can't uh, lock in. Uh, for industry, uh, the amount of ammunition, the amount of uh, platforms you need, et cetera. Uh, and then for training and readiness, uh, you, we've gone through this drill several times. We've, we've got all kinds of analysis that shows uh, that our training would be reduced significantly. Uh, our exercises, la last year, for example, we did, like I said, 63 just last month, 63 exercises around the world. Uh, we did 23 CTCs. We've got guys going through uh, all kinds of uh, aviation training. We're dropping a lot of bombs. Our pilots are flying a lot of hours. All those things would come down. All your readiness levels, all, everything that's been achieved over the last three, four, five, six years, seven years, all of that would start going in the opposite direction uh, with continuing resolutions or if you went back, in, you, you went back uh, to previous budgets. Uh, I think it would be very significant and the risk would increase with China. It would be the wrong signal to send. send. Well, um, I think there are a lot of people who agree with you. There are others that don't. And it's important that we get the facts out. And as I said before, uh, you two have a tremendous a lot of experience in this role, and we're going to have to rely on you a lot. Um, Secretary Austin, um, and in building off of what I just talked to the general about, um, my second question for you is about the impact of potentially reducing the department's civilian workforce to offset top-line cuts. As you know, the department faces a lot of challenges in hiring and retaining a, its civilian cybersecurity workforce due to attrition and loss of talent to the private sector. Um, and I do represent NSA, and I have for 20 years. Um, how, how will cuts to the department's civilian cybersecurity workforce further exacerbate this problem and make us more vulnerable uh, to cyber attacks by foreign actors? Well, it'll, it'll be, uh, it'll have a significant impact, uh, as you know, uh, Cyber threats the, in this day and age are enormous, and they come from every corner of the globe. And, and so our, the force that we've developed, I think we've done a, a really good job of uh, putting together a significant capability that allows us to protect our interests uh, and support our, our overall uh, uh, national defense strategy. Uh, we need the right people. We need the talented people, to your point, sir, uh, to be able to... Uh, to continue to do the work that we're doing. Now, we, we've really pressed hard to make sure that, uh, you know, we're going after the right people, we're providing initiatives, 
Uh, we're mindful of the fact that this is a very, very competitive uh, field. And, uh, and so we have to do what we need to do to make sure we get the right people and we can retain the right people. But to your point, if we cut those kinds of people, then I think it will have a significant impact on our war fighting capability. Thank you for your testimony, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ruppersberger. Got to write that down. Mr. Womack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Austin, General Milley, great to have both of you here again. I echo the comments of my colleagues in appreciation of your service. General Milley, personally to you, thank you for all that you've done for yeah. this country. Um, I'll miss working with you, though I'm sure you're not going to miss sitting in these hearings in front of these panels uh, when, you, when you leave your position. Um, Secretary Austin, this, this is a question pretty much for you, but I'm a big believer, as my colleagues know, in the state partnership program. I think they've added a lot of value around the globe where we have those. Um, no better example than what the Californians did with Ukrainians uh, over time, and, and, and I just believe it it brings a lot of value to uh, not only the partner nations, but for our own forces, for, for the National Guard troops that get an opportunity to do some training with these partners. Um, this is related to Taiwan, and as Chairman Calvert said, a delegation of us just recently visited there. I, I wonder how best we can help our Taiwanese friends uh, prepare for contingencies, and is a state partnership or a modified program like the state partnership program for Taiwan, is it uh, advisable, practical, uh, possible? Uh, what would be your comments? Why or why not? I think it is. And, and uh, since you were just there, you know that we have a number of uh, National Guard elements uh, that have been working with our with, uh, with our partners in Taiwan and uh, in and increasing uh, their uh, their proficiency in a number of areas. Uh, to your point, this program adds value uh, wherever we are, wherever we're partnered with, uh, with uh, around the globe. Uh, and 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 I think the point that you uh, the example that you use is a great one. You know, Ukrainians uh, benefited greatly from all the work that the, the guardsmen did, uh, you know, over the years. But yes, I believe that. Uh, that our continued work uh, in with the guardsmen in uh, in Taiwan, I think, will be will be very very valuable. So we'll continue to to, to work to structure this so that we optimize, uh, you know, the effort of the guard and uh, and it complements uh, all the other things that we're doing with the, with the Taiwans. And Mr. Secretary, the compacts of free association with the Marshall Islands and Micronesia are up for renewal in the coming months, with Palau's expiring next year. I understand the defense provisions of the existing compacts remain valid regardless of renewal. Uh, that being said, the incentives of the freely associated states to continue the security relationships expire with the economic assistance. Because of their strategic location to our military assets present in the countries, these partner states seem to provide key terrain that can help advance our strategic goals as we concentrate on the Indo-Pacific region while at the same time helping us directly combat Chinese influence. Can you uh, articulate the importance of these compacts uh, to the department? Extremely important, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I agree with the points that, that you've made. Uh, they, they do provide, uh, they magnify our efforts in terms of uh, access, presence, uh, and, uh, and I, so I think we will continue to do everything we can to make sure that uh, we're strengthening our relationships and that uh, we're, we're whatever ac additional access we can we can gain, and uh, we're, we're going to continue to do that. So. Um, the department's budget this year includes requested multi-year procurement authorities, and we've already talked in, in your opening statement about that. Now, this is a question basically for Mr. McCord. Uh, these multi-year procurement authorities are not typical for munitions, but have been used when procuring large uh, systems such as aircraft and ships. Uh, Mr. McCord, can you expound on why the DOD went this route with munitions and how you selected the, the munitions that uh, I should have mentioned in my uh, in the beginning of the question, the SM-6, AMRAM, Larassum, 
this sort of thing. So can you expand on that? Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Womack. Yes, the, um, the thought had been for many years that you buy missiles in, in, in enough quantities that a multi-year wasn't necessary. But what we found uh, clearly with Ukraine was, was that the, the industrial base there on more ground-focused munitions was not agile enough uh, due to a number of factors the Secretary has already mentioned, supply chain issues, common components, um, uh, workforce issues in, in the COVID era that have, that have decreased that agility. So the effort that, that we undertook in the department really under Deputy Secretary Hicks' leadership was to do, do the thinking about where would we like to be in a few years for the, for the more uh, larger scale Pacific contingencies and start taking those steps now, things that, that ideally maybe if you had known four years ago where you'd be in Ukraine, you could have done some of those on the ground side. And that's what led to what we're doing here is to expand, as you said, for the first time into the munitions world and also to, we, we have a concept we've been working on in my team for some years of having multi-years that overlapped and reinforced because so many of these missiles are produced in one, with, by one or two companies. And so we brought that concept in as well. Um, we, we do believe that this is going to, as the Secretary said, provide more of a stability signal uh, that companies rely on because this is a space in the budget where there's been a little more fluctuation than there has been on something like submarines where we also have multi-years. And so we're trying to bring stability as one of the tools we need. It's not the, it's not the only thing that needs to happen in terms of the health of the industrial base, but we think it's going to be a big thing that we can do to position ourselves better for, in particular, for, for the larger scale uh, contingencies. Sorry for going over, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank all of you all uh, for your service, uh, General Billy, uh, I'm glad you still have your Texas license uh, as you look at the next phase. Uh, but I want to thank all of you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I want to ask you one question, uh, but let me just lay out uh, uh, the facts. Uh, do you believe that great power competition in the Western Hemisphere is a defense issue? Now, we know the importance of the State Department, USID, and Department of Commerce, and everybody else. I understand all that. It's a comprehensive approach. But I listened to the answer that you gave um, Ms. Granger, and you talked about what Southcom is doing and all the work they're doing that. But I noticed you left Northcom, which has Mexico, because right now you have Southcom covers everything south of Mexico. Uh, and if you look at what China is doing, 36% um, of their total food imports comes from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, when you look at um, um, lithium reserves and all that, it's in that area of responsibility. You look at infrastructure projects, I don't want to go through all of them, but you know, infrastructure projects, 5G development, safe city projects. Um, space inf infrastructure, which is very important, what they were doing down there, and so on and so on. Uh, and that's China and uh, Russia. But then if you look at, at um, uh, Mexico, which is right next door, uh, I'm concerned that NORTHCOM is not paying that much attention to them. And I'm sure they're going to say they disagree with me. I understand all that. Uh, but we did ask... Uh, follow-up information, and I think we're still waiting for that follow information after we had the NORTHCOM commander. But just to give you, we just got back from a bipartisan uh, meeting in, in Mexico. Uh, fentanyl, uh, and you know the problem, how many people it kills in the United States. Uh, that fentanyl precursors will go into Manzanillo, Lázaro Cárdenas, uh, and then about 75% of all the fentanyl and fake pills move through the Tijuana, San Diego area, if you look at the geography itself. Uh, when you look at the critical locations of the PRC investments, uh, there, a lot of them are close to our northern border, lithium and other areas. When you look at the investments they've done in Manzanillo and Lázaro Cárdenas, which is where they get their shipments from China, you look at the new Isthmus courier that Mexico is doing, which is their new Panama Canal on land, uh, who is doing the investment in those two areas into the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific? A lot of it's the Chinese. And there's some other space infrastructure things I cannot talk here at this location, 
but it's very concerning what we're seeing. So my question is, is there a way, and I think we did ask for y'all to study whether Mexico should be part of Southcom, and I understand, you know, Mexico, Canada, part of Northcom, I understand all that, but either that or we get them to work a little closer together because I don't see an alignment that we do all this great work and we need more resources in Southcom, but we're leaving out Mexico. And that's, I live in Laredo. I live just a few miles away from the border, just literally a few miles. So I'm concerned about that. So my question, after I laid all that, uh, do you think that great power competition uh, is important uh, part of, of the defense in the Western Hemisphere? I, I certainly do, uh, sir, and I would also say that all of our combatant commanders feel the same way. And I'm sure that if General Van Herc were sitting here today, he would say that this is an area that, uh, that's important to him. Uh, I would also say that uh, our combatant commanders routinely uh, uh, coordinate with each other, pass information, uh, and, and work with each other to ensure that there are no significant gaps and seams between uh, between the combatant commanders' areas of responsibility. Um, I do know that General Van Herc has, uh, continues to engage uh, the leadership uh, in, uh, in Mexico. I mean, that's r routinely. Uh, and, and, uh, and I would say that this is important, but we can never do enough. I'll make sure, by the way, that you get the answers to your questions. Uh, and, and this is something that we need to continue to focus on. Uh, and you mentioned the fentanyl uh, problem. It's a, uh, primarily a, a uh, law enforcement issue, but but you know, DOD does will continue to do what it what it can to support the overall whole of government effort in this regard. So. Yes, sir. And and we'll work with you in any way that we uh, do. Uh, my time's up, but uh, there was another young Hispanic soldier that died in Fort Hood. Besides Vanessa Guillen. I know there's an investigation. I'm talking to the uh, Secretary of the Army tomorrow, but just want to bring that up to y'all also. Not, not lost on us, sir, and I, I'm very, you know, my, my heart goes out to her family and, uh, and to her teammates. Uh, and again, this will remain an area of focus for us. Thank you, Mr. Secretary.